So this is my friend Max. Uh, Max is in seminary, and he is discerning a call to ministry, as, as all ministers are always doing. And he is going to share with us for the first time today. Uh, so Max, welcome. A, a taste of what ministry is like, right, in the real world, outside of a school setting. Um, <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's graded. So, um, as you are all listening... <laughs> yeah, I am going to ask you to just keep a couple of things in mind for me. Um, and if you do feel so called to give me any sort of feedback, um, I would love to take it. Um, this way we can all participate into the, in the future of, of the church and whatever that might look like. Um, so as you are listening, I invite you to consider what you're hearing, right? What's the message? Um, that's going to probably be different for everybody. It may be different than what I am even intending on telling you. That's fine. Um, I would also like for you to consider what are the things that you really liked? You said, oh my God, his hair was perfect. <laughs> you can tell me that. Um, also, if there is areas for growth as well, say... Um, <laughs> yeah, no pressure at all I, but anyway I do appreciate you all being here and, and um, participating and walking this journey with me um, just by your existence so um, in addition to all of that Zach is my supervisor so if you do have any issues with anything go to him and he will take care of it <laughs> Um, so I was informed by Zach um, that we've actually been following the uh, the narrative lectionary, um, and we've been hanging out with the prophets for a little bit. I don't like the narrative lectionary. Um, I am I'm a traditionalist, I guess you could say. I enjoy the revised common lectionary. Um, and frankly, I just don't know that I have the experience just yet to explore elsewhere. So I'm shaking things up a little bit, and that's very apropos for open table. And it's also very apropos, I think, for when we're talking about the prophets. I mean, prophets, if you're familiar, are really good at dropping these like sassy nuggets into, into the story, and they shake things up. They shake up the status quo. They ruffle some feathers. They redirect um, and I think that's what Haggai is doing here, uh, just to give us a little more, a uh, little more food for thought here. Uh, I'm going to read the portion of Haggai that's right before what Anne read for us today. Um, and if you're not familiar, Haggai is a very short book; it's only two chapters. Um, I do recommend if you get a chance to just give it a quick skim, scan, and survey, uh, as it's it's pretty tasty. So. <clears throat> Right before the, the, the king and the high priest and all of the people are so moved to do what they need to do, um, and the Lord is with them, Haggai drops in and he says, uh, Is it time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruin? Consider how you have fared. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And you that earn wages, you earn wages to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider how you have fared. And that's when God says, go up to the hill and build my house. Um, forget your own houses, right? And everybody is moved, and they do it, and God says, great. Now, Haggai delivers this message uh, after the exile is over, right? So the Israelites have returned. They're trying to get themselves reestablished. They're very busy, right? They're, they need to set up infrastructure. They need to set up policies and agreements, and, and they need to consider the economy, right? People need to eat, and they're trying really, really hard, but there's this drought, and there's war, and all of these little things keep happening, you know, like when you step on gum and then track it all the way through your house, 
somebody unscrews the top of the salt shaker and now your meal is ruined. It just keeps adding on and on and on. And that's fine. They just keep it trucking. They follow the plan. They continue to set up the infrastructure and worry about the economy. And then here comes Haggai suggesting that maybe this isn't working, right? Maybe not everyone is actually being fed in the way that they need or deserve. Haggai is offering a moment of pause and reflection, saying, how have you fared? How is, how is this working out for you? Right? Everyone is worried about their own house, while the thing that binds the community together in identity and purpose, the temple at this time, is lying in ruins. How is, how is that working for you? This moment of pause and redirection, this sassy nugget that Haggai drops in, um, I think, is an invitation to live empowered through our values, which is really hard. Right? But take courage, take courage, be strong, for I am with you. Cue Jesus. Right? Emmanuel, God with us, love enfleshed. Now Jesus is on the scene to drop some sassy nuggets and shake things up. Between Haggai and Jesus, the, the Israelites have done okay, right? Now they've, they've assimilated. Um, they have this stratified community that's under Roman rule. They're fine, right? But one could say that this is just a, a different version of Haggai's, you know, everyone is clothed, but no one is warm. You know, as humans, we really love to reenact our trauma in an attempt to get it right. Um, and we just keep doing the same things over and over again. It's just what we do. But there's good news. All right. Jesus comes in and is giving us the same invitation, but I think it's a little more clear. Right. Jesus responds to the question about who is going to get the inheritance, who's, whose wife is this, this one person, right? The, asking the important questions. No, no. Jesus comes in and, and gives us a new invitation and says, it doesn't matter who you marry or how many times you've been married it doesn't matter how many children or cars or homes or dollars you have. The grades don't actually mean anything. The gold and the silver are God's. <laughs> Sorry, parents. <laughs> the gold and the silver are God's. The trees, the wood, the dirt are God's. You and I are gods. And we are all loved just the same. And we are held in this divine love that binds us so securely to one another that it's scary. It's terrifying. What you do affects me. And what I do affects you. And in reenacting right, all of that hurt and all of that trauma and all of that confusion over and over and over again without actually hearing the invitation or living by our values or even considering that that's an option, we hurt one another, we say things we don't mean, and we still love one another. Right? And that just adds to the confusion. It's just, it's scary, right? But what if, what if we notice that scary divine love that's right in front of us all of the time? And what if we, instead of running from it or avoiding it, we nurture it? What if that is the house that we build? The one house for the whole remnant? 
Take courage. Take courage. Take courage. For love is with you. Amen. Amen.